On June 28, 1972, a husband and wife from Bedford, New York were admitted to the hospital, showing signs of having been poisoned. The wife, Grace Cochran, would survive, though she was almost entirely paralyzed. Her husband, Samuel Cochran Jr., would not be so lucky, passing away in the late hours of that June evening. When investigators began looking into their mysterious illness, the culprit in this poisoning turned out to be something completely unexpected. A can of Bon Vivant Vichessoise soup. The bacteria Clostridium botulinum is a contaminant sometimes found in food, which is easily destroyed through cooking at low heat. But when packaged in the airless vacuum of a can, the spores can grow into a deadly toxin, causing a sickness known as botulism. Deaths from botulism are rare, though they have been seen in communities that can their own food, and in rare but notable cases in commercially canned foods. Unfortunately, as Vichyssoise soup can be served cold, there was no heat to kill the virus when Samuel and Grace Cochran ate the soup straight from the can. The story, and the subsequent recall of 6,444 cans of Bon Vivant soup, was national news by the following weekend. One of the readers to hear about this unfortunate death was a young composer with a few stage credits under his belt, and it was this story of a Vichyssoise soup gone wrong that he recalled in 1980 when he thought, what if, instead of one man dying, it was 52 people dying? And what if those people were nuns? Much like the previously discussed Shen Yun, I can't tell you the first time I saw a poster for nonsense. It's one of those cultural items that is omnipresent to the point of feeling hallucinatory. I know at some point I'd become familiar enough with the show's Hirschfeld-adjacent key art that I recognized it, and I sometimes heard about productions of the show happening in small companies, though I never attended them. I couldn't tell you a single plot point or song from the show, but it did undeniably exist. As it turns out, Nonsense is a five-actor comedic musical from 1985, which, when it closed, held the record as the second longest-running off-Broadway musical of all time. The show, which receives dozens of regional productions each season, has book music and lyrics by one man, who continues to be an active force behind the Nonsense franchise to this day. And yes, I did say franchise, because the other thing I learned when I looked up the show was that Nonsense has a sequel. In fact, Nonsense has multiple sequels. To be blunt, the mainline Nonsense series consists of seven full-length two-act musicals. There is also a spin-off cabaret show, a gender-swapped version of the first show, and three large cast editions for larger theater groups. All in all, there are 12 musicals in the Nonsense franchise, all of which are licensed, all of which get produced with some regularity, though the very first, the titular entry, is the most common. And if you want to watch any of the musicals in the mainline series, you don't even have to wait for a live production. All seven have been professionally filmed, and in 2019, the full series was added to Broadway HD. Not sponsored. So, if you wanted to watch the whole series, you could watch a different Nonsense musical every day for a week. But of course, if you really wanted to commit, the run times of all seven add up to 11 hours and 19 minutes. So, technically, it would be possible to watch all of them in a single day. But who would be a big enough fool to subject themselves to that? I'm about to watch every Nonsense musical. Hello, friends. It's me, a fool. What I'm about to do is I'm going to watch all seven Nonsense musicals in one day. I don't think anyone has ever done this before. I don't think that anyone has ever wanted to do this before. I'm only like 30% sure that I want to do this, but that 30% is a very strong part of me <laughs> that wants to do this. Okay, so when I pressed play on Nonsense at 7.15 a.m., I had made the decision to go in completely blind. I had done that initial toe-dipping of research, so I knew I was in for a review-style comedy starring a quintet of actresses in full nun habits, but beyond that, I would be experiencing the series with no background research. However, for your sake, I think it may be best to give you a baseline to work with, which means we need to start all the way at the beginning, which, of course, is... In 1962, Pope John XXIII called the hugely influential Second Ecumenical Council of the Vatican, better known as Vatican II, a four-year series of discussions undertaken in order to modernize the practices of the Catholic Church in an increasingly secular 20th century world. 
While the consequences of Vatican II are enormous and contentious, one tiny reform is of interest to us. In the decree Perfecte Caritatis from 1965, Section 17 states, The religious habit, an outward mark of consecration to God, should be simple and modest, poor and at the same becoming. In addition, it must meet the requirements of health and be suited to the circumstances of time and place and to the needs of the ministry involved. The habits of both men and women religious which do not conform to these norms must be changed. While simple in text, the practical effect of this decree was huge. For decades, the religious dress of the Catholic Church had been rigidly adhered to, but now the door was open for members of the Catholic leadership to dress in a more modern style. And one of the most notable groups to undertake this adjustment was nuns. When you think of a traditional nun's habit, you probably think of something like The Sound of Music, the black veil with a white bandeau, the white coif around the head and neck, the white wimple over the chest, and the black dress extending all the way to the floor. But in the decade following Vatican II, sisters and religious orders worldwide began experimenting with modernized versions of the habit. While some retained the original style, others, particularly younger sisters, moved towards shorter dresses and even uncovered hair. By the late 1970s, the traditional outfit wasn't yet uncommon, but it was something of a novelty. Which is exactly why a Dominican friar, Brother Raymond Jarbeau, gifted a young composer, Dan Goggin, a mannequin dressed in a full traditional nun's habit. Goggin, who had grown up in Alma, Michigan before coming to New York to pursue a career as a countertenor, had booked an early gig in the ensemble of the Broadway play Luther before heading out on the road with fellow cast member Marvin Solly in a comedy music duo called The Saxons. After touring through the 1960s, Goggin and Solly pivoted their writing skills into another career, writing songs for industrial musicals. Yes, those things made popular by bathtubs over Broadway. And they, they said, um, we've got a big industrial coming up. All of our writers are assigned. And if you want it, you can have it. There was a stack of pictures and resumes on the guy's desk. And he said to me, he says, you see all these right here? He said, those are all people have written in to like audition to be writers. You can see I, I, I have been very, very blessed. Goggin crafted songs about L'Oreal, Halston, Charles of the Ritz, and Campbell's Soup, among others. He was living on New York's Fire Island in a shared home with seven other people when Sister Mary Mannequin, as she would be known, came into his life. The mannequin quickly became a fixture of his circle, an inside joke shared by friends who would come over to Goggin's home to find the nun cunningly posed in some mundane task. In time, the mannequin also caught the attention of Stephen O'Coin, a photographer who had worked with Goggin on the industrials. He proposed an idea. Could Sister Mary Mannequin be turned into a line of greeting cards? The idea intrigued Goggin, though after considering the logistics of it, they decided they would need multiple poses and expressions, rather than the nun's static face. Enter Marilyn Farina, a dental assistant with little performance experience but natural comic timing who was happy to jump into the habit for a photo shoot. Through a friend who worked in a card shop, the group was able to sneak into the 1980 National Stationery Show after another client pulled out last minute and were able to bring their nun cards to a national audience of sales reps. The rest is the stuff of nonsense legend. And in two days, we sold 38,000 cards. Yeah. We were on the fourth floor, and on the first floor was Hallmark. Somebody came in one day and they said, where is everybody in, in the Hallmark? And they said, mm -hmm. they're all upstairs on that fourth floor with that nun. <laughs> As the venture grew, Farina began to go out to card shops in person in order to drum up interest. She and Goggin began developing a distinct character, Sister Mary Cardelia. Get it? As well as a backstory. Recollecting the tragic Vichyssoise botulism news story from 1972, Goggin established the following pitch. A convent cook named Sister Julia, child of God, made a tainted batch of Vichyssoise soup which resulted in the death of 52 nuns from botulism. Never mind that the soup in the Bon Vivant case was toxic because it had been canned, a small but unimportant detail. And they were trying to raise money to bury the sisters. So she'd be out there and say, buy a card and bury sister. <laughs> After a few years of success with the cards, another one of Goggin's friends, the comedian Steve Hayes, suggested the next logical evolution of the character, a sketch comedy show. This was not the first time Goggin had written for the stage. He had had success with a 1972 off-Broadway review called Hark, written with Solly and book writer Bob Lorick, as well as a 1975 musical called Johnny Manhattan with Lorick, which had a showcase run. The Nonsense story, as the show would be called, would be looser in structure. 
the premise of raising money to bury the sisters remained, but the content of the show was a review, consisting of songs and sketches connected only together by the characters performing them. Farina remained as Sister Mary Cardelia, joined by two additional nuns, a friar, and a priest. To be clear, these were actors playing nuns, playing characters in the sketches. The tone was more ribald and raunchy, befitting its setting, the legendary NYC club, The Duplex. The show opened September 29th, 1983, and while originally scheduled to only run for four weekends, the show was extended due to popular demand, closing in June 1984 after 38 weeks. The positive press led Goggin to consider moving the show to off-Broadway, though producers advised him that a review-style series of jokes wouldn't play as well in a traditional house. To that end, Goggin made two major decisions. Firstly, the Nunset story would be rewritten into a more traditional book musical, albeit one that still used a review-like structure, with a shortened title. And second, Goggin would collect backers himself and self-produce the off-Broadway run. Oh, and one other note was taken. Goggin noticed that the three women in the cast got more positive response from the audiences than the friar and priest did, so the cast became all nuns. Eighteen months later, following an eight-week tryout at the Baldwin School, off-Broadway audiences met the Little Sisters of Hoboken. And just about 37 years later, I spent a full day with them. Okay, so I just finished Nonsense One. It's about 9.15 in the morning, um, and I finished, and I, it's, it's that early and I just watched the entire musical. It was definitely exactly what I thought it was going to be at the outset. It really reads like the writer just came up with a bunch of nun-based jokes and then created the thinnest possible through line to, to tie them all together. I'm gonna spend more time on the plot of Nonsense since the sequels are all canonical and knowing the setup here means not having to repeat my explanations later. The show is framed as a benefit performance by the sisters of Mount St. Helens School in Hoboken, New Jersey. In keeping with the fiction of the botulism deaths from Sister Cardelia's backstory, the money from the greeting card line was used to bury 48 of the 52 deceased sisters. But then... Then Reverend Mother bought a VCR and a camcorder for the convent. <laughs> Cardelia, renamed to Regina later in the run, pulls in some of the surviving sisters for a benefit performance on the set of the school's upcoming production of Grease to raise enough money to bury the remaining four, now lying in the convent freezer. The performers are Sister Mary Hubert, Mistress of Novices and Second in Command, Sister Robert Ann, a nun from Brooklyn and born comedian, Sister Mary Leo, a novice who wants to be the first nun ballerina, and Sister Mary Amnesia, who lost her memory and second name when a crucifix fell on her head. Now my name is Sister Mary! <laughs> For a moment there, I thought I almost remembered my real name. From that initial setup, the various planned elements of the benefit performance begin spinning comically off the rails. Sister Amnesia does some crowd work, handing out gag gifts. It's a St. Christopher Motorist prayer book! Isn't that beautiful? A song is interrupted by a foul-mouthed puppet nun. Why, Sister Mary Annette, what are you doing here? Regina accidentally gets high on a nitrate popper found off stage. Oh, Lord! <laughs> and Hubert barely manages to keep her obvious desire to be Reverend Mother in check. Yes, I know Reverend Mother's here, a stepping stone. The review style structure means that the show can veer wildly between different musical styles, including hymnals, light rock, soft shoe, ballad, vaudeville duet, country, gospel, and a direct homage to the Andrews sisters. The St. Andrews Sisters of Holbrook. Give yourself a chance to see my own the days of Jane, find the nearest book screen and let yourself go. You also have comedy segments like Robert Ann doing impressions with her veil, the color lilies are in bloom again. Thank you. or this cooking segment with a bunch of Catholic food puns. Mary Magdalene tarts. <laughs> Bet you they're easy. <laughs> there's not really a lot of stakes to it either, which, I mean, it feels silly saying that there's no stakes because it's a cabaret performance, it's nuns, like what do you, you, it could easily be like, well, what do you expect? It's nonsense. The only real through line is Sister Mary Amnesia finding out her name, which I don't dislike because it leads directly into the resolution of the conflict. It's not just a joke that goes on throughout the entire show. It ends up paying off in a meaningful way. Paul. Sister Mary Paul. There was the opportunity here to do something more more like a play that goes wrong, like we find out more about the people themselves, 
Because we find out about the people, we find out about the nuns, but it doesn't build anything. We just find out details about them that are used to set up comedy later. There's no world building beyond what is happening on stage. I do wonder about the necessity of, like, is there not, are there not better pieces out there that do a similar, have a similar focus on just being, you know, comedy, except they, um, they have more substance to them? I don't know. All in all, I found Nonsense to be perfectly fine on a first watch. A little simple in its comedic sensibilities, but the performers on film are great, and the score is catchy and varied. So it was with elevated hopes that I began watching Nonsense 2. Okay, so I just saw Nonsense 2, and um... It's the same show! Like, it's literally... I couldn't, I can't even express to you how much it is literally exactly the same show. Yup, as it turns out, Nonsense 2, The Second Coming, is almost beat for beat the same as its predecessor. You get another appearance from Sister Mary Annette. That's mean, you apologize! All right, I'm sorry you're nuts. <laughs> you get the same segment of Robert and doing impressions. Nonset Boulevard! The prop comedy segment, now styled as a straight-up catalog rather than a cooking show. The only Catholic guide to gift giving. The <laughs> Even the same end of act conflict where Regina gets incapacitated, except now Hubert gets drunk too. You know, I'm starting to feel a little dizzy. How about you? Mm, I feel divine. Are you sure? Am I sure? Is the bear Catholic? Does the Pope poop in the woods? <laughs> The reason why they get tipsy on sake instead of poppers is because the show now takes place on the set of the school's next musical, The Mikado. And while the Grease setting of the first one was incidental, they make more comedic use out of the setting in this one. Tokyo Rose calling Reverend Mother! Tokyo Rose calling Reverend Mother! Come in, please! What is this? Woof. There is a token semblance of a plot about the nuns returning by popular demand after the first show, as well as a vaguely mentioned plot that Sister Amnesia, who learned her real name at the end of Nonsense but still gets called Amnesia anyway, might actually be a Franciscan, and also there might be a talent scout in the audience. But none of that really matters because, look, Leo can roller skate now. <laughs> I, I am really nervous that if they're all like this, if if the remaining five nonsense musicals are also the exact same structure with no alteration, um, I'm gonna be concerned. Like, that's probably gonna start to weigh on me a little bit more than the first one did, because the first one at least had the benefit of it was new and it was setting stuff up. As it turns out, that would not be the case. All right, so I just finished <laughs> It just hit me. It's, it's continually hitting me what I'm doing. Um... <laughs> The title card for the third show refers to itself as Nonsense 3 The Jamboree, though the official title, as licensed by Thames Whitmark through Concord Theatricals, is Sister Amnesia's Country Western Nonsense Jamboree. So, after Amnesia got her memory back, she remembered that she wanted to be a country singer, so this performance is a tour stop at the Grand Ole Opry in Nashville to promote her recently released album. To their credit, the filmed version was recorded at the genuine Grand Ole Opry, with a ton of special guest stars that I'm sure were really exciting to a specific audience in 1998. You meet the same people on your way up as you do on your way down. This is also the first show to switch up the cast, with Regina and Hubert being replaced by Sister Wilhelm, a nurse, and Father Virgil Trott, Sister Leo's brother who also happens to run a country radio station. There are other adjustments. Sister Mary Annette appears on her own, without a visible puppeteer. What are you doing here? You're supposed to be in Reverend Mother's drawers! <laughs> There's another St. Andrew's Sisters song, now retitled The Many Pearls of Wisdom. We got many pearls of wisdom here for you. The prop comedy segment happens again, but now it's a country auction. Is our eye-popping, handcrafted Santa Lucia pet! <laughs> also, while in Nonsense 2 there was a throwaway line explaining why they still called her sister Amnesia, here she's introduced with her real name and then people start calling her Amnesia anyway, without explaining why. It was around this time I started wondering who these musicals are actually for. The first one, sure, people like to laugh. But the level of bending over backwards to keep these shows canonical to each other feels... Well, how many people are going to remember this single line from Nonsense 2? Sister Leo came to us direct from the Lulu B. Tuggins School of Ballet, Baton, and Hula in Elgin, Illinois. And they grew up as part of Mississippi's famous Trot family singers. Hold on here! 
I thought Leo was a ballerina from Elgin, Illinois. No, no, no. We didn't move to Elgin until Ronnie Joe was 16. When you're from the Delta, you just can't hide your roots. Oh. I like the, the way in which it's like you get performances, but then you also get a little bit of banter that feels like it could either have been scripted or have been improvised. But also, like, you get little... They get to find little ways of putting comedy in through, like, the advertisements they have to do in the middle of the show. You know, their sponsors and whatnot. As opposed to the first two, which felt cheesy and that, like, you know, we're all just here to have a good time. It doesn't matter how flimsy the plot is. This one feels much more along the lines of, like, we're all here to have a good time, but it also feels of a piece with what we expect of, like, a Grand Ole Opry performance. After they get past the need to connect it to the original nonsenses, it works. It just works on its own. I would, this is probably the one that I would be the most willing to watch on its own because it feels the most complete. For as out there as the writing gets, I did end up liking Jamboree, and at the time of editing this video, it's actually my favorite out of the series. It's just unfortunate it had to be immediately followed by... Um, okay, I've st I just watched Nonsense 4, Nuncrackers. Um, in many ways, it's a return to form. Nuncrackers is where the reality of watching seven musicals in a single day started to really weigh on me. Yes, there are some practical differences with this one. It has the largest cast, with the five original nuns plus Father Virgil and a chorus of four children, and it has perhaps the most overt moral out of the whole series. Or at least attempted moral, I think it's a bit mixed. Sadly, the plot communicating that moral happens almost entirely offstage, so what we're really watching is a bunch of unconnected variety acts with some token mentions that a plot is definitely happening somewhere else. They are, or they're not. They are. They are. Well, are they? Yes, yes, they are. In the original Nonsense, there was a feeling that the health inspector arriving off stage at the top of Act 2 and finding the four dead nuns lent the evening a sense of tension, since it meant they had only one day to raise the burial money, which only made the performance more harried and primed to go comically wrong. Here, someone mentions that their presents were stolen and people go, Oh no! Anyway, here's Father Virgil in drag as Julia Child. Today we are going to make fruitcake, the Christmas gift that lasts a lifetime. <laughs> this was also the show where I realized I could recite the recurring bits. Amnesia is once again giving out little favors to the audience. There's another St. Andrew's Sisters number. Sister Mary Annette shows up to sing a song. The prop comedy segment is styled as a literal QVC gift-giving show. Moral combat. <laughs> The framing of the show, as a television program being run out of the convent basement, also doesn't help. When things went wrong in the first three shows, the nuns had to comically deal with it in real time, in a show-must-go-on sort of way. Here, they can just call hold. Well, run on, darling. Tape, the tape is rolling. <gasps> we'll fix it in the edit! <laughs> yeah, this one just feels, it feels looser. It feels, in some ways, it, it has pieces of what the Jamboree had, which is that it has a very clear definitive reason why they are performing. It just doesn't put the pieces together quite. It's a little too disjointed. It's a little too everything going wrong and then no consequences for things going wrong. It begins, but doesn't really complete, a conversation on uh, income inequality with regards to Christmas. Because the whole thing, the, the climax is that Sister Mary Paul has handed off the presents to this poor family that just wanted to come see the tree in the studio they were filming in, unclear. Um, the friar and also Sister Hubert also bring up things about like, you know, we grew up poor, but you know, we, we kept the spirit and the heart and everything, you know. And it's interesting that they would bring that up. I don't know if there's really anything done with that. This one I don't think I can endorse quite as hard as uh, the Jamboree, nor can I endorse as hard as the other two. It's maybe the more, again, the pieces work better, but they're not put together in a way that leads me to be like, yeah, go do this at the holidays. Yeah, these later sequels are getting further away from the original benefit performance style, but if anything, that's just making the recurring bits stand out even more. So if my summaries feel like they're getting shorter, rest assured it's because there's less and less plot with each show. Case in point, Here is the entire plot of Meshuggah Nuns, the ecumenical nonsense. When the entire cast of a cruise ship production of Fiddler on the Roof gets sick, four of the nuns, Regina, Hubert, Amnesia, and Robert, join up with Jewish performer Howard to do some kind of variety performance instead. That's basically it. There's no offstage plot being loosely tied to what's happening, it's a performance for the sake of performance, with two new comedic wells to mine, Jewish humor and boat-based humor. All ashore, that's going ashore. 
Now, you might be wondering whether this show is laughing at Judaism versus laughing with Judaism. You might also wonder whether this show has the same recurring bits that were in the first four shows. Well, I can give you a clear answer to the second one. Oh, it's a god is awesome, you pencil sharpener. <laughs> the duty-free shopping cart. Shake hands with Mae West, star of stage, screen, and television. Yeah, yeah. He should be wealthy. He should be fun. If there's a major development in Meshuganuns, it's probably Sister Mary Annette, who not only pops up multiple times across the show, but is referenced as a puppet for the first time, with Regina admitting that Robert is controlling her. But she's still sometimes referred to as autonomous, like she can move of her own volition? Are we in reality, or is this puppet a real character? What's rehearsed, and what's unexpected? What are the rules of this show? Who cares? Here's Hubert as a squid for some reason. Oh wait, no! You don't wanna eat me! See, I'm real spicy and I'll give you acid reflux! <laughs> oh no! Pepto! I feel like it's the one that has gotten- it's had the easiest time of separating itself from the nonsense of the, like, mythos that has built up around these characters. They still reference a lot of it, but, like, they barely mention Sister Amnesia. Like, I guess they mention, that they mention that she got hit, but they don't mention anything about the publisher's clearinghouse. They don't mention anything about her... I guess they mention she's a country western star and just have to buy that for a second, but, like, it doesn't come back. Again, they continue to reference details from other nonsenses, which implies that you've watched all of them. Which, like, I'm watching all of them now, but, like, even if you have watched all of them, like, as they're coming out, like, if you watch them in the 90s up to now, I can't imagine you'd remember all these references. Who the hell is c keeping up with the de- Like, this is why I wanted to do All in One Day. First of all, because it's very funny, and secondly, I- Otherwise, I'm gonna forget everything that happens in these musicals. It's six- Musicals worth of lore to remember. Nonsense 6, Nun Sensations. It's nuns in Vegas. That's the plot. All right, I suppose there's something else going on since we find out at the end that the nuns were essentially tricked into performing in Vegas. And who tricked them? Do you know who the owner of this place is? Vinny Prestipini. <sighs> okay, so to explain this for the people that saw Nun Sensations and said, who the hell is that? In Nonsense 2, you know, four musicals ago, Vinny Prestipini is a student at the convent school who was kicked out by Robert Ann, and who then was revealed at the end of the show to have fictionalized the story about Amnesia being a Franciscan, as well as the talent scout. You expelled Vinny Prestipini? Well, I had no choice. After what that little hooligan did, they say poor sister Fermina will be on lithium the rest of her life. <laughs> If you're wondering who could possibly be familiar enough with the Nonsense series to understand that niche reference to one joke in one sequel being referenced in a show written 12 years later... I also wonder that. Also, before I forget, Amnesia Audience Interaction, now it's a game show! Sister Marionette, except she doesn't show up until Act 2. Prop comedy segment styled as Sin City Souvenirs. St. Andrew's Sisters of Hoboken. Gospel finale performed by the only black nun. Yes, that happens in every show except Jamboree, and I think that's only because she wasn't in it. If I sound exasperated, I promise, it's only a reflection of how I felt at the time. Okay, I, d <laughs> I don't want to do another one. <laughs> I gotta watch a seventh Dead Sense musical after this. Not that it was unenjoyable. Not that it was completely unenjoyable, but it just felt like the most um, on autopilot it's ever been. I, I don't even know at this point if you could possibly watch this one without the huge amount of context. Admittedly, when they first come out at the beginning, they do this like showgirl introduction and they literally just spell out, here is the backstory of every single character. There's just so much world building that you kind of need to have. Because I didn't feel that way about none, the Christmas one or the Jamboree one. Like, you didn't need to watch the previous ones in order to get it. But for this one, I feel like you'd just, you'd come away more confused than anything. Now, as I've mentioned, the seven musicals in the Nonsense series are canonical, with references in every show to the events that happened in the previous ones. Sometimes these are almost prophetically forward-thinking. I keep hoping when she remembers who she is, we'll discover she belongs to the Franciscans. <laughs> well, though, there's not that much of that left after Reverend Mother built the cable access TV studio in the convent basement. Other times you have jokes that repeat across almost every show, like the name of Reverend Mother's parents, who were both circus performers. Uh-huh. They were billed as two tons on a tightrope. 
two tons on a tightrope. They were two tons on the tightrope. They were both a bit on the hefty side. <laughs> So, when I say that the title of the seventh Nonsense musical was first name-dropped in Nonsense 2, well, I don't think it was intentional, but it shows that Goggin had been holding on to this pun for a long time. Nonset Boulevard! Nonset Boulevard! Goggin has confirmed that Nonset Boulevard from 2009 is the final musical in the mainline Nonsense series, and even during my marathon it felt like it was wrapping things up. It has one of the more interwoven plot lines, despite having a song at the beginning essentially mocking the very idea of giving the show a plot. All these years we put on shows and never had a plot. Sister Leo, who transitioned from being a novice to a full nun between Jamboree and Nuncrackers, had a song in Nun Sensations called I Left Him There, where she began considering whether the convent was right for her. Now, with the nuns having been hired to perform at the Hollywood Bowl, or so they thought. Well, when we got here, we realized we were invited to perform at the Hollywood Bowl. Arama. Sister Leo auditions for a movie and gets a callback, leading to a crisis of faith for both her and the other nuns, who consider whether to let her leave. As weird as this may sound, Nunset Boulevard is the only show, besides Nunsense Classic, where the fact of the characters being nuns is a significant plot point in the show. For shows 2 through 6, it's certainly present, in Amnesia's borderline sacrilegious gag gifts, or Hubert's frustrations with the nuns saying anything off-color, but they might as well just be slightly morally upright showgirls. Which is what makes Nunset feel like a suitable ending. Once you call attention to the novelty of nuns in the performing arts, it would be hard to go back to ignoring it. Which is a lot of theory to apply to a musical where there's also a song whose entire premise is, Hey, remember this movie? But you are blessed! You are in my chair! Yeah, considering how much these musicals reference Golden Age Hollywood, this really does feel like the ending it was always heading toward. Like Lana Turner sitting at the soda fountain in Schwab's drugstore. Like Lana Turner down at Schwab's drugstore. That's about as rare as Lana Turner down at Schwab's. The experience of watching seven of them is terrible, but the musicals themselves are not truly awful. Um, I still had a fun time. I mean, this is still this is still fun to do, even if it sucks right now. Unless someone contradicts me, I am the first human being in history to watch all seven of these back to back in one day. Um, I can't recommend it to anyone. <laughs> really does feel like it's just, I mean, the, they kind of talk about it in the fifth and the seventh ones about, you know, we're just here to entertain, we don't have to have plot, we don't have to have anything else. But they do, they do ultimately have narratives to them. They're trying to tie it together. It is 9.30 at night. I started this 14 hours ago and I am ending it now because, holy shit, y'all, why did I do this? <laughs> Ultimately, the marathon certainly answered the question of what the Nonsense series is, but it also left me with a whole bunch of new questions. As I started to go into research in earnest, I learned that there's actually quite a lot about the Nonsense series online. In addition to articles about the show's history, Dan Goggin himself has given multiple interviews, rehashing the history I laid out earlier in this video. But many of the more intricate questions about how the musicals were crafted still didn't have satisfying answers. So, I figured... Let's see how generous Goggin is with interviews. We had a uh, stage manager uh, who then became our choreographer who always says to people, when we get to a theater, she said, now you must understand, there's theater and there's nonsense. They have no relation to one another. <laughs> we live in our own little world. Turns out, pretty generous. While Dan Goggin has an affinity for all the musicals in the Nonsense series, he's comfortable pointing out that his least favorite is Nonsense 2. See, when Nonsense opened off-Broadway at the Cherry Lane Theatre in 1985, it wasn't an overnight success. It built up an audience slowly through positive word of mouth, plus four wins at the 1986 Outer Critics Circle Awards, for Best Off-Broadway Musical, Best Book, Best Music, and Best Debut Performance for Semina De Laurentiis as Sister Amnesia. The confessionals for she Almost immediately, Goggin was approached by producers who saw the show as a potentially enormous moneymaker, cheap to produce, comedic in tone, and appealing to everybody. Publishing house Samuel French paid a then-record $77,000 advance to secure the amateur rights, and within a year, there were replica productions of Nonsense opening in Philadelphia and Boston. And the following season, there were more than a dozen productions of the show nationwide. 
And while the show continued to run off-Broadway, after nearly closing at Cherry Lane but unexpectedly securing a new booking at Circle Rep and later the Douglas Fairbanks Theatre, producers and audiences began asking for what was essentially the same show but different. But I know at one point they were doing one and two in rep in New York oh, I remember. when we were still I... running. Had I known that they were going to be running all the time, I probably would have at least tried to vary the, the, the formula a little bit. In short, the reason that Nonsense 2 feels like a beat-for-beat -beat retread of the original Nonsense is because it literally was. I barely skimmed over the surface in my earlier recap, but believe me that almost every scene has a direct corollary in the first show. Solos are in the same order, the novelty songs make the same jokes, and going off the filmed productions, Regina's solo number even features the exact same choreography. It's only with Jamboree, written five years after Nonsense 2, in defiance of new licensor Tams Whitmark's request that he wait seven years before writing a sequel, that Goggin began writing for the only reason that mattered to him. Writing to me was more of a means of an end so that, you know, I could go out and play with everybody. And I said, we have nine shows now that's plenty to play forever. How do you know when you're finally done and you can comfortably walk away from it and then launch it? When you have the end. <laughs> then it's over. And I'm oh. always so relieved when it's done, oh. and then I can play. Many were spurred by requests from regional companies who programmed the shows. Nuncrackers from the need for an annual holiday show, and Meshuggah Nuns to bring in more non-Catholic audiences in Florida. Not that Nonsense courts a specifically Catholic audience, obviously. Goggin makes it clear that the show is aiming for an audience of everybody. I, I always tried to be, you know, pretty funny for everybody. The clearest summation of that ethos, as it turns out, is in a line at the end of Meshuganuns. When you're laughing, you're not Catholic, you're not Jewish, you're not hurting, you're not hating, you're just laughing. Amen! Remember that quote, because we will be coming back to it. As different as they are, all seven musicals follow a fixed structure. They all take place in real time, without a fourth wall, and acknowledge the audience as an audience. Whether they are pretending to be at the Grand Ole Opry or a Vegas casino, the show takes place on a stage, in public view. Sometimes the show will have a larger overarching plot, like the nuns in the freezer in Nonsense, but even for the shows that don't, there's always some kind of story. To clarify, plot is what literally happens, and story is how the characters grow in response to it. Of the musicals, I'd argue that shows 1, 3, 4, and 7 have the most well-realized plots, culminating in a clear climax that happens on stage just before the finale. However, with many of those plot developments happening off stage prior to the climax, they often feel disconnected from what the audience is actually watching. Plot by way of telling, not showing. Maria, what's the matter? They say I ruined the ballet. Who said that? The other kids, but I didn't mean to do it. Oh, we know that it was an accident. By comparison, the shows with the most satisfying stories are probably 3, 5, and 7, since you really do get the sense that the nuns have changed over the course of the performance. Whether that's Amnesia balancing her music career with her devotion to the Order in Jamboree, Regina's growing empathy and understanding towards Howard in Meshuggah Nuns, or Leo's decision, spoilers, not to leave the Order at the end of Nunset. If you noticed the absence of shows 2 and 6 on that list, that's because they both put a greater focus on comedy primarily, often at the expense or erasure of plot and story. Subsequently, 2 and 6 end up near the bottom of my personal ranking of the Nonsense musicals, which is, incidentally, this. Sorry, I just didn't like Nuncrackers. While all the shows are intended to stand on their own, regardless of how many you've seen before, the need to keep them all canonical to each other does necessitate some often blunt moments of recap. Every show except Jamboree gets some version of the We Still Call Her Sister Amnesia conversation. Don't get confused if you hear us call Sister Mary Paul Amnesia. You may have read about how she lost her memory when a crucifix fell on her head. Yeah, a while back a crucifix fell on her head and... This is the nun who lost her memory when a crucifix fell on her head. We just call her Amnesia because once a crucifix fell on her head and for a while she couldn't remember who she was. Similarly, every show after the first has to justify Amnesia's country song, she has one in every show, by repeating the plot points about her becoming a country singer after regaining her memory. I find this weird since by the time we get to shows 6 and 7, there's nothing in the script that would lead the audience to see a country song as out of character. You could just as well have her sing it without this preamble. 
The Nonsense series is paradoxically both accessible to new audiences while also expectant that audiences will remember what happened in previous shows. Doggin has cited the example of I Love Lucy, where Ethel Mertz's middle name changed three times across the series, as writers never expected audiences would remember. Or, if they did, wouldn't care. However, unlike a TV show, which you can now binge, I can't imagine people would see in-person productions of Nonsense 2 and Jamboree in close enough proximity to remember that Sister Leo is from Elgin, Illinois, and it realize it's incongruous with her new I'm actually from Nashville backstory. In a way, it's a testament to the precision of Goggin's writing, that after watching the entire series, I can't recall any moment when a character said something that was canonically inconsistent. In another way, I can't imagine that anyone besides me, an egghead with a research fixation, would care enough about canon in order to notice moments of inconsistency. But while the world building is durable, one thing that isn't is the diegesis. Now, to briefly explain. Diegesis is, essentially, everything in the show that the characters experience as happening literally. Most musicals utilize non-diegetic musical numbers. The characters in West Side Story, for example, aren't literally breaking into spontaneous dances in the middle of a street. It's a musical, so the moments of heightened emotion are presented as songs to highlight them. It's possible for a musical that contains mostly non-diegetic songs to also include diegetic moments when characters are literally performing. Think of Bottle Dance from Fiddler on the Roof, or Bushel and a Peck from Guys and Dolls. It's also possible, though a lot rarer, for a musical to remain entirely diegetic. Both Hedwig and the Angry Inch and Six are in-universe concerts of pre-rehearsed songs. Even rarer is the show that is mostly diegetic, but utilizes non-diegetic songs for emphasis. The mystery of Edwin Drood is all an in-universe performance until the final number leaps into magical realism. Accordingly, many of the nonsense rules of structure apply to those last three musicals. They happen in real time, are set on a stage, have no fourth wall, and acknowledge the audience. Consonantly, the nonsense shows establish themselves as fully diegetic up front, with the nuns performing extant songs that they have rehearsed beforehand. However, in the case of the first show, the diegesis is broken 34 minutes in, in order to emphasize Robert Ann wanting to sing her solo. No. I don't mean to sound ungrateful, but I'd rather have a spot that is just for Robert Ann. I'm not asking for a lot. And this continues across the series. Nonsense 2 is fully diegetic until the 48-minute mark. Jamboree makes it 53 minutes. Nuncrackers, 31 minutes. Meshuggah Nuns, 58 minutes. Nun Sensations, 49 minutes. All of these shows spend between a quarter to half of their runtime establishing a diegetic structure, only to break it unexpectedly for a song that's no more significant to the plot than any other. The odd one out is Nunset Boulevard, which breaks diegesis in its opening number, but after that continues to flip between the two without ever clarifying which numbers are supposed to be diegetic. We're still literally on a stage, and the audience is literally the audience, but also the characters sometimes break away from that conceit to have book scenes that are ostensibly private that the audience aren't supposed to be hearing. Which speaks to part of the reason that fully diegetic musicals are so rare. If everything is literal, then songs no longer arise from heightened emotions. If the songs are rehearsed, their lyrics are no longer discoveries by the characters. There can still be character growth in the performing of a song, but if it happens, it's in how the song is performed, rather than the performance itself expressing growth. When I presented these questions to Dan Goggin, I got the only answer he could provide. It doesn't matter. See, here, here's the thing, Zach. I, want, feel, I feel that the true secret to happiness is to always remain shallow. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't ask questions. Okay. <laughs> no, but, but I'm teasing you. Every Most everything about nonsense from the standpoint of uh, an analysis, mm -hmm. I've learned after I've written it. <laughs> like people will say, well, you have to have this and the development and the blah, 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 and all, if you're writing a play. Well, I never learned how to write a play. I just wrote one of those funny. The idea that enjoying nonsense is contingent on turning off the part of your brain that analyzes things more deeply is an interesting one, and we'll definitely come back to that. Yeah. Then again, perhaps it's judging the nonsense series unfairly to point out issues like diegesis and story structure. As Goggin's response indicates, those are not the primary aims of nonsense and its sequels. For those, we have to look at Goggin's ethos as a creator more broadly.
There are a lot of ways you could describe the goals of Nonsense as a work of art. That it's a show intended only to make people laugh. Somewhere in the world, every night, somebody is laughing because of one Absolutely. of those Nonsense shows. Absolutely. And it's Absolutely. like, wow. That it's a corrective for a world that's increasingly depressing. For two hours, I just forgot there was any problems anywhere in the world. That it's an excuse to spend time with close friends. I mean, every time we're working on one of them, we all have a great time, and everybody's always laughing. But if I had to summarize the goals of Nonsense and Dan Goggin collectively, it would be this. And the word that I keep coming back to is comforting, which is that, like, for the audience and for the actors, it's supposed to be something that, like, you know, comforts you. Um, do you think- I love that. Goggin has repeatedly emphasized in interviews, including my own, that Nonsense is not intended to offend, to challenge, or to make people uncomfortable. We never comment on current stuff. It's comedy, it's not religion, not politics, none of that. He contrasts this with another show that was running off-Broadway while the Nonsense story was at the duplex. Sister Mary Ignatius explains it all for you. If God is all-powerful, why does he allow evil in the world? <laughs> that show is still a comedy, but one featuring pointed criticisms of Catholicism, clearly written in response to author Christopher Durang's own frustrations with church dogma. Goggin loved the show, and knew from the beginning that Nonsense would be nothing like it. Despite the characters being mostly or entirely nuns, I agree that the shows remain a-religious. The comedy is always framed as laughing with the nuns about the minutiae of their faith, and the tension between their devotion to the order with their own desires to be performers. There's never any worry that the veils will come off, so to speak. Which is partly what makes Nunset Boulevard feel like a definitive ending, as, spoilers, it's the first time anyone in the series chooses to prioritize anything higher than the practice of their faith. <gasps> wow! You look beautiful, sister! And yes, Leo comes back to the Order at the end, but it feels like a line has been crossed. From my experience, part of what kept me engaged during the hellish experience of watching all seven in one day was seeing how the performers evolved as the series went on. Goggin has directed dozens upon dozens of productions of the Nonsense shows, and as such has developed a dedicated core of repeat performers who have stuck with the shows. Rue McClanahan returns to Mother Superior for the first four shows, Bambi Jones plays Hubert for shows four through seven, Deborah Del Mastro plays Robert for shows three through seven, and is the best actress in the whole series, by the way, and even though Stephanie Wall only plays Leo in the final musical, she has a cameo in Meshuganuns, an indication of ongoing involvement in some capacity. I was initially saddened to see Samina De Laurentiis depart the role of Amnesia after Nuncrackers, but across the back three shows I watched her replacement, Jeannie Tinker, grow more confident in making the role her own. Bagels and locks! <laughs> <laughs> it's no secret that Nonsense has a large presence in smaller companies, like community theaters, which may have a similar ensemble of returning actors or dedicated amateurs. To Goggin, seeing the performer experience the joy of performing is a part of the appeal as much as the plot. And, and they're, you know, probably seeing Aunt Mary is playing Mother Superior, and I can tell you right now, Zach, she was better than one that you'd see on Broadway. That's how fabulous she was. You know, the, the local people, they're just like, oh, this is... They couldn't even get to this level on Broadway with the town. Tell them we have in our town, you know. <laughs> to a degree, Nonsense fits into my favorite genre of media, works of art where you get the sense that every actor is having an absolute blast. Think of movies like Mamma Mia, Waiting for Guffman, Clue, or more recently, Knives Out. There's an appeal that shouldn't be ignored to audience appreciation of people having a good time, particularly in a musical like Nonsense, where the fundamentally dynamic format of live theater means that the experience of witnessing actors' emotions in real time is unavoidable. When I say dynamic, of course, I'm referring to the necessity of musicals performing in a perpetual present where even if the script was written many years ago, the requirement of performing it in whatever the current day is lends the show a vibrancy that doesn't always exist in film or TV. Of course, like all dynamic artworks, material written in one time period doesn't always play the same way when you perform it years later, and the goal of keeping Nonsense apolitical is a constantly moving target. While the material in the filmed Nonsense may have comforted audiences in 1993, the march of time has certainly cast some of its jokes in a different light. Sister Pocahontas. How? 
I will have you know I am not fat. Oh. I simply retain water. Well, hello, Lake Superior. <laughs> and what does that make you, dear? The Black Sea? <laughs> Watch a couple of butch nuns dance. <laughs> This crops up across the entire series, from Jamboree, You cut too much! The prince is going home, a princess! From Nuncrackers, So the circus midget was Jesus! From Nunset Boulevard, Oh! When there was Julianne and Whoopi! And Debbie Reynolds too! And Mary Tyler Moore to the name of you! I want to be clear that this is a broader topic. This is not a nonsense-specific issue. Comedy is the quickest type of writing to age, and the line between laughing at and laughing with, or, if you will, the line between comfort and discomfort, is ever-changing. It's encouraging, then, that Goggin doesn't consider the content of the pieces to be inviolable. He's gotten requests from licensed productions to cut or rewrite lines, and he now has a stock of adjustments that he can immediately send out. When I, when I write a show, when I finish it, it's like it's not mine. So if you're coming to me and saying, listen, we're doing it in our theater and we think people might be offended by this, can, can we cut this out? And it's, yeah, go cut it out. That is great. And it's not like it's my baby. In this respect, what might be the biggest criticism of the Nonsense series, that the shows are mostly plot-free collections of comedy bits with no intention other than to make people laugh, turns into its saving grace. If the entire purpose of the show is to make people comforted, and there's a joke that the production fears will discomfort people, then it's arguable that cutting or adjusting that line is actually a greater method of respecting the author's intentions than it would be to leave it as written. This is all, of course, done with the intention of creating comfort for the audience. But nonsense goes beyond that. Goggin is committed to the show's being comforting for the performers as well. As attested to by the performance history of the show, the type of actor who can play a nun is essentially limitless. With regards to age, Nonsense has been a unique refuge for older actresses, who often jump into the show between larger projects. Notable names who have donned the habits include Phyllis Diller, Pat Carroll, Dodie Goodman, Joanne Worley, Nichelle Nichols, Sally Struthers, and Cindy Williams. The 20th anniversary tour in 2003 had an all-star cast of Kay Ballard, Georgia Engel, Mimi Hines, Darlene Love, and Lee Merriweather. And a 2013 run at the Muni in St. Louis featured Dee Hody, Beth Lebel, Ken Page, and Phyllis Smith. If you want to get technical, the show isn't even limited by gender. In 1998, a Brazilian production of Nonsense made the choice to cast the show with all male performers, in a production that was so successful it eventually had a brief run in New York, leading to Goggin borrowing the idea to create Nonsense A Men, the fully gender-swapped edition that is licensed separately. As the theater becomes more inclusive of gender fluidity in casting, Goggin retains that the only true requirement in order to be in Nonsense is believability. You've got to believe that these are real nuns. It doesn't matter who plays these parts, so long as the person you've chosen make, lets the audience believe that it's the character that you want them to see. We are going to get five men, comedians, who can create these characters the same way Robin Williams did Mrs. Doubtfire. I'm not going to talk about the Doubtfire comparison. I know what he means. Goggin has also made efforts to showcase that performers of any race can be in nonsense, casting diversely in the regional productions of the show that he directs. And while there's no practical example of this, the movement requirements of the show are so simple that you could cast a performer of any physical ability in the shows. And like Goggin's own troupe of recurring performers, he's fielded calls from regional theaters who praise the community that nonsense can help to build between performers. I think there's something about the way the show is. People will call and say, oh, well, you know, our sisters, uh, you know, we did the show three years ago, but, you know, we still go out to the movies together and we do this. This all leads to my closing analysis on nonsense, which is that perhaps all the discussion of the flimsy structure and the dated humor is judging the show on the wrong metrics. Rather than asking, is the show good, perhaps we should ask, is the show doing good? Is it making the world better in a small but appreciable way? It could be argued that over the last four decades, there are few musicals that have had the sort of impact Nonsense has had. Not on the medium of musical theater broadly, but on the experiences of the estimated 25,000 actors who have worn the habits. We often talk about the most significant productions happening on Broadway or in major regional houses while ignoring the work done in community theaters, which for many people may be the only theater they see. 
As theaters were reopening after a long and unplanned hiatus, there were 93 productions of the various Nonsense musicals last season. Mostly of the first one, naturally, but all seven were performed somewhere. Perhaps Goggin put it best himself. It was always about making people laugh. No politics, no religion. There's nothing more rewarding than having people going out and saying, oh my God, I never laughed so hard. I had such a great time. And we always have our naysayers, you know, who say, oh, this is just silly corn. Some, somebody wrote, said, people say this is worthless fluff. Well, it may be fluff, but it sure ain't worthless. <laughs> so that's what I learned after watching the entire Nonsense series. I hope you enjoyed this video and... Hmm. Well, I, I suppose I could end the video there. Nice little moral about how we can look at this series another way. But as I was going over my notes and making the outline for this video, I started making some connections I hadn't expected to make. I mean, the fact that you can't call the gypsy robe the gypsy robe anymore. You know, any anything that has a double meaning, oh, I can't say that anymore. Just these little comments here and there that started sticking with me. And I'm glad I'm not having to write stuff, you know, mm -hmm. that kind of censorship now. And they changed the way that I viewed the show, and it had me going back through it with a finer comb than before, with the sense that I may have missed something the first time through. I agree totally with Mel Brooks, who said political correctness has ruined comedy. Because after I interviewed Dan Goggin, I went back and watched the full series again. Not in one day, but I took more in-depth notes this time. And the more I considered the series critically, which, yes, is what he advocated not to do, the more this alternate interpretation of the show's impact started coalescing for me. And I realized this video was going to have to be longer. Like, significantly longer. As in, I think I'm only, like, just past the halfway point of this video's runtime. Because the conclusion that Nonsense's impact is in fostering community, that's true. It's also not the whole story. I mentioned earlier Goggin's acceptance of adjustments being made to Nonsense regionally, but I didn't give too many examples of what, specifically, people are requesting to change. So let's look at a single joke, to start with, that a single company has made a single request to cut. Near the end of Act 1 of Nonsense, Regina confiscates a small bottle that Robert found in the locker rooms backstage. Huh, it's called Rush. The bottle, a nitrite popper, results in Regina getting aggressively high and rolling through a series of absurdist actions and impressions. And one of the impressions, in the middle of the bit, is this. I gotta be uh, driving Miss Daisy back down to the pig. <laughs> For the uninitiated, this is a reference to the 1987 play Driving Miss Daisy and the 1989 film adaptation which starred Morgan Freeman. Now, on the surface, this is a fairly benign joke, and one that I can't imagine anyone objected to in 1993. But to ask why an amateur production would request to adjust it is to locate the divide between two vastly different ways of viewing nonsense. Goggin typically frames the desire to keep nonsense apolitical as an issue of not wanting to date the show with topical references. Like if we were having a show tonight, they wouldn't go on and say, well, ain't there something the way they can't get the speaker in the house? You know, if Mother Superior were there, She'd have a speaker set right now, you know. However, taken in league with how Goggin discusses the appeal of the series, I've come to a new conclusion about why political humor doesn't suit the intentions of Nonsense. It has the potential to discomfort. Now, as mentioned, the goal of Nonsense above everything else is to create comfort for audiences, and there are certain topics that are understood in the arts to simply be off-limits if you're trying to create something entertaining that no one will disagree with. Politics is one, and religion is another, which Nonsense adheres to despite the characters being nuns. In fact, their identity as nuns serves to comfort the audience. They can't react aggressively to things going wrong, which means audiences are prevented from having to watch real anger or heavy swearing, while also making the muted reactions the characters do give all the funnier for their restraint. Did you make that, dear? Yes. <laughs> she made it. Wow. It also assures that the comedy will tiptoe up to the edge of being risque, but never go over. This works both ways, as the actors auditioning for Nonsense can be assured that they won't have to perform any material that could be discomforting. There's no fear of emotional anguish or personal trauma. What makes this tricky, however, is that comfort is, unavoidably, 
a subjective measure. One actor may be comfortable with certain material on stage that another actor will be discomforted by. Another thing that's subjective is humor. A joke may land for one audience, but fall flat for another. And when you have a joke that touches on material that discomforts some but not all, you end up with the problem we have with the Driving Miss Daisy joke. A problem, incidentally, that Goggin does not understand. Nobody has ever been offended by that. The Mother mm -hmm. Superior is stoned on Rush, mm -hmm. and she's imitating all kinds of different people. She's just doing like an impersonation. Mm -hmm. um, and and everybody's always laughed at it. And and I don't think any, I've never heard of anybody taking offense. In Portland, they said, oddly enough, it was the young people. On some level, I understand this perspective. The crux of the joke really boils down to Regina mistakes a stool for a steering wheel. There's no intention here to mock Morgan Freeman or black people generally. If there was another character that was equally famous for driving a car, you could sub in that impression and lose nothing. So where is the discomfort in this joke? Well, for a younger audience, it pulls them out of the show by reminding them of something that isn't comforting white actors doing impressions of black characters for comedic effect. And if you feel like that's just people reaching for something to be offended by, rest assured, Dan Goggin agrees with you. Nobody is comfortable in the political correct crowd mm -hmm. allowing any kind of humor that would, would apply to somebody else, even if it's true, even if it's, you know, all the, all the stuff that goes with it. The gun is drawn, and they really want to shoot. Mm -hmm. And, you know, if you if you don't offend them or don't do whatever it is where they feel justified to shoot, mm -hmm. it's kind of like ruined their whole evening. Because <laughs> mm -hmm. they came in with that attitude. This is where I actually have to disagree, and for two different reasons. Firstly, I don't think the young people that are discomforted by this line are looking to be offended by it. Rather, I think they are unable to ignore the subtext of it. Look, I'm about to make a huge generalization here, but I hope you'll understand where I'm driving at. Dan Goggin was born in 1942, and in talking to me, he emphasized the diversity of the town he grew up in. We lived in a small town in Michigan, and we had every kind of kid because we had, um, there's a college there and that we had with a lot of uh, Mexican kids. In fact, the most popular kids, in my, two group people in my high school were met a Mexican boy and girl. It's notable that Goggin said he doesn't recall experiencing any prejudice firsthand. We never had, uh, or you never felt prejudice in our town. But still recounted the following story about the nuns who raised him. We asked one time, I remember, we asked one of the sisters and we said, do you have, do you, I suppose back then we would call them, do you have any colored sisters? And she said, no. But she said the reason they did not accept them is because there was enough prejudice that if they sent them to teach, there would be parents that would not want the kids being taught by a colored person. In a way, it was, it was more of a practical decision. Because ultimately, while Goggin grew up during the civil rights movement, he also grew up during the rise of suburbia and within a culture that prioritized the comfort of white Americans over all else. It was a time when, if you grew up in a town like Alma, Michigan, a town of less than 10,000 people that was 95% white, it was almost expected that you would grow up seeing prejudice as something that happened elsewhere. Not everywhere, and certainly not where you were. The young people discomforted by the joke haven't had that luxury, not just being sheltered from prejudice, but the ability to see it as a thing that happens elsewhere. Inequality is widespread, and conversations about it dominate the cultural consciousness. It's not that the prejudice of the 2010s is worse than it was in the 1950s. Similar issues existed in both decades. But a child of the 2010s, on the whole, isn't similarly sheltered from learning about them. A younger generation isn't seeking for material to be offended by, they're seeing what an older generation didn't, either because they were protected from it or because they actively chose to ignore it. The reality of the world is profoundly discomforting, and always has been. What's different about the younger generation of today is that they know that. What this ultimately means for the Driving Miss Daisy joke is that what an older audience sees as a simple impression reads to some younger audiences as one tendril of a much larger cultural undergrowth. 
And whether or not you see that as an overreaction, it is a source of discomfort for them. And telling them to just not be discomforted by it is asking them to look at the show through a lens of ignorance they do not possess. That's the first reason I disagree with Goggin. The second reason, however, is more semantic. There's some things where I think, you know, oh please, you know, you're worried about two people that may be in the audience that this is going to bother, and, and they're going to call the newspaper or something, so you don't want this to happen. See, I don't think it's just a few people here and there that would be discomforted by the content of nonsense. Now, to be clear, I don't think that this particular line would be enough to keep a company from producing the show. As mentioned, you sub in a Ms. Frizzle reference or something, and I think you're all in the clear. And there are, obviously, still many young people out there who have been sheltered from seeing the parallels mentioned before. It's not all young people who act like this. But I think where you genuinely get into the question of whether the show is salvageable is in its second song. There were hot and tots with rotten tots and baskets on each mother's head. The song, A Difficult Transition, hasn't been the subject of many requests to adjust the content, but I don't think that's necessarily a reflection of how little people find it discomforting. Companies could make adjustments to the material without requesting to, and the ease of chopping a few verses out of the song in order to not name drop two ethnic slurs is probably something they feel safe doing. It's also possible that theater companies who are discomforted by the number, with its troubling parallels to the French colonization of Africa, why are these African tribes coming to an island south of France? I said, what on earth was I thinking? Or what, what was I not thinking about? Those companies just aren't going to program nonsense. It will be performed by the companies who don't find it discomforting, and we'll come back to them in a second. And to be clear, this anecdote focuses on the first show, Nonsense, because it is the oldest, it seems to need the most adjustment, and it is the most performed. There are adjustments I would recommend to all the shows in the series, but none of them are major. Jamboree and Nun Sensations had one line each, and my discomfort regarding Meshuggah Nuns was mostly rooted in the question of whether a Catholic author can write self-deprecating humor about Jews ethically. Don't Jewish women drink? Never, it dulls the pain. <laughs> the thing is, ultimately, it would be well within Goggin's right to accept this limitation and simply tell the companies who find the humor of the Nonsense series to be discomforting to just not produce the shows. The scripts have no obligation to continue changing with the times if Goggin doesn't want them to. Except they kind of do, because if you remember back to the first half of this video, the purpose of Nonsense as a series is to provide comfort to everyone. If a joke discomforts the audience, the show has a certain obligation to remove it. A decision that Goggin, remember, broadly supports. We're doing it in our theater, and we think people might be offended by this. Can, can we cut this out? And it's, yeah, go cut it out. I don't care. So you end up with the paradox that Goggin is simultaneously frustrated at the people who find the show's material discomforting, while also absolutely willing to approve changes in order to assure comfort. And, in the case of Difficult Transition, he may have actually proved how rewrites don't inherently cheapen the work. We had two or three theaters that called and said, when you have that can we change that section or take it out? I, I said, well, let me look at it. So I wrote him a different version. So I changed it all that they all came from places in France. Mm -hmm. And 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 it was way funnier. And, um, and, and so in that way, I thought, oh, that was really cool. What complicates all of this, however, is the response Dan Goggin gave me when I asked him point blank about jokes that discomfort audiences. A stereotype doesn't come from one or two crazy people. It mm. comes from a whole group of people that seem to all fit into a pattern that create the stereotype. I mean, it, 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 and whether whether it's true or not, Sally Struthers was in one of the companies that wanted to do that. She said, this is a thing that drives me nuts now. She said, every little thing, somebody's going to be offended, so you got to change it, you know? As before, I disagree that this is only a handful of young people taking aim and trying to be offended. I think that as culture generally moves towards a more active inclusivity, the so-called general audience will only reflect the younger generation's political correctness more and more. 
which need not hamstring the writing process, as shown by the funnier rewrite of Difficult Transition. But it does point towards a crossroads for the future of nonsense. You can either keep the work dynamic through edits and adjustments, or stick to your own guns and watch the number of audience members who leave the show completely comforted decrease over time. I'm not even advocating a particular pathway, just pointing out that it will have to be one of the two. But plenty of musicals aim to comfort the audience. What makes Nonsense different is that it doesn't stop with the audience. Goggin wants to provide comfort to the actors, too. But how the show aims to assure comfort is worth digging into. There's a famous photo of Dan Goggin that has come up in interviews before, of him standing backstage ironing the nun's habits before a performance. When you consider Goggin as the writer behind Nonsense, perhaps it does seem a bit odd for him to be taking that active a role backstage at the show. But Goggin sees it differently. To him, this is just what being part of the Nonsense team entails. I said, well, you know, the castle is in my neighborhood and they don't really want to wait for the van to come and get them. Why don't you not hire a wardrobe person for the show? We have doubles of everything. So the girls will do the show, I'll wash and iron the doubles, and then the show will be over and we'll all go back to Manhattan. Could you argue that this is an issue of not delegating to other members of the team? Perhaps, but Nonsense has never hired three people to do the work that one person could do. One of the reasons the show never transferred to Broadway, despite the successful off-Broadway run, was because they would have had to abide by union rules regarding hiring staff, which struck Goggin as unnecessary. You know, I mean, there would be, there would be times in New York where somebody would say, oh my gosh, this, is, this, has, this has got a rip in, it needs to be sewn, and the uh, lighting spotlight operator says, I don't have to give it to me, I'll sew it up for you. <laughs> and it would be, you know, 20 minutes before the show. Uh. Everybody just kind of did everything, and, and it's always been that way. And we're kind of like this little gi just gypsy group that can go around and put on shows. This method of production aligns with a mid-20th century understanding of the theater industry that I would broadly summarize as the summer stock model. The utopian ideal of theater arising from a group of artists who band together to put on a show by all lending a hand wherever needed. If something needs to be done, you don't hire someone else or say it's not your job. You jump in and do it. Similarly, if that means coming in early or staying late, that is the price you pay for the work. Your commitment to the project is measured in what you are willing to give up for it, be that time, wages, or comfort. Even after the theater industry formalized itself into long-standing companies with concrete job positions, the notion of the actor as willing to endure anything to perform still remained in place. As Jesse Green writes in a 2022 New York Times article, the idea that theater is a calling, not a job, and that the two categories are mutually exclusive, is so ingrained in the industry's ethos, not to mention its business model, that demands for accommodations are often met with doubt or derision. Caring for actors, some say, is coddling, suffering is a badge of honor, and the theater is properly a Purple Heart Club. Even the notion of the actor with a day job speaks to this ideal. Having one job that pays the bills, and then working just as hard at another job that doesn't pay the bills, but that you do for the love of the game. Over the last few years, and especially in the time since theater companies reopened post-pandemic, there's been a necessary re-evaluation of this notion of the working actor, and along with it a greater series of structural reforms. Greater understudy coverage, the rise of violence and intimacy directors, five-day weekly rehearsal schedules, and the elimination of the dreaded 10 out of 12 tech day. A new generation of actors is coming into a greater respect for their own time and labor, and understanding that when they step into a rehearsal room, they do so with an expectation that they are there to do a job, with labor protections. I don't think this is something that Dan Goggin would disagree with, to be clear. If he wants to iron the nun habits himself, he's free to do so. It's not as though he's expecting the actors to also jump in with additional physical labor. Self-motivated extravocational work is different than a director criticizing an actor as not sufficiently motivated when they ask for a day off from a dance-heavy show. Though it should be noted that Goggin does praise actors who show outsized commitment. Kay, I think, was 78 at the time, and Mimi was 70, and those girls were out 21 weeks, eight shows a week, never missed a performance. Mm. And nothing like some of the younger yeah, people yeah. today. They're, they're pro professional, yeah, real professionals, yeah. Total, total professionals. Yeah. Where this gets more complex and personal is when the labor we're discussing isn't physical, but emotional. 
Because there are a lot of things that can cause discomfort for an actor in a rehearsal room, and while Goggin can claim that there's something inherent to nonsense that prevents it, there's no guarantee that what comforts one actor will comfort another. In fact, I would argue that there's more than a few elements to the Nonsense series that absolutely have the potential to discomfort an actor. Sister Mary Regina, for example, is the subject of a recurring joke across the entire series. Well, hello, Lake Superior. <laughs> Sister Mary Regina, you might be overweight, but as a reverend Yiddish mama, you'd be zoftic. That's great. You used to be big. I am big. You're telling me. <laughs> There's nothing inherently wrong with acknowledging the presence of a plus-size actor in the role, but considering how much of the industry leads actors to overanalyze their own bodies, plus the historical sequestering of larger actresses into comedic roles, I can't imagine a script that only brings up the performer's weight as the setup for jokes is going to sit well with all performers. And yes, there is a song in Meshuganuns that refutes this. My fat is my fortune. Pass me that eclair. But that is one song in one of the lesser performed shows. Also, I don't love the costumes the ensemble are wearing, but maybe that's an issue with just this production. As another example, the presence of Terry White and Bambi Jones as Sister Mary Hubert in the filmed versions, plus the gospel finale that Hubert always sings, mean that many productions will latch onto the expectation that the character is black. Only three of the six musicals she appears in have dialogue confirming this outright, though the filmed versions are meant to serve as models for the licensed productions to follow. And now with Broadway HD, where some theaters thinking, like, would we like to do this? They can look at the show and check it out and see how it goes. And, and I don't think Hubert is an inherently discomforting character to play. The issue here is more about the realities of being an actor of color. You may not agree with me when I say that being the only non-white performer on an otherwise all-white team is inherently discomforting, and certainly I can't speak from experience. But if I can for a moment speak on behalf of the BIPOC performers who have been in that position, it's potentially very discomforting. Even the request to not overthink and play only the humor of the scene has the potential to make an actor uneasy. Sister Mary Amnesia, past Jamboree, has really nothing to do other than stumble around speaking malapropisms. She really is, like, dopey. She's the character of dopey. Um, that's really what she is. She's dopey mixed with that nun that does art, whatever her name is. I can't remember. There's, like, an art nun. Is that a dead baby? That may be fun for some actors, but not for all. I remember one time there was a girl in one of the shows, and she was playing Sister Leo, and she came from very, very serious theater. And she says, as an actress, how, how do I develop this? And I said to her, well, you know, it's interesting. I don't think we've ever had an actress in this part. Now, when it comes to the productions directed by Goggin, the ones that are filmed, the ensemble of recurring nonsense performers likely helped to alleviate discomfort. And hopefully if Bambi Jones ever felt tokenized, she felt comfortable speaking up. But in licensed productions of Nonsense, these assurances of comfort are in no way guaranteed. Particularly if the performer was hired through an open audition and is treating the project like a job with workplace safety requirements, and not as a passion that they will suffer any microaggression to maintain. It's obviously true that some actors will have no issue with the content of these scripts, rendering these concerns irrelevant. All I'm arguing is that it is still possible that an actor could be discomforted, and in that situation, authorial intent ceases to matter. The odd parallel that must be brought up, though, is that both Nonsense and the broader labor movement in theater have the same end goal, assuring actor comfort. The expectation is that nonsense is a process where the roles don't require emotional trauma or physical exhaustion. They are, practically speaking, roles with low labor requirements. However, and this is the biggest, most crucial part of the whole argument, nonsense's method of how it aims to assure actor comfort is wrapped up in that earlier quote from Meshuggah Nuns, which I'm now bringing back. When you're laughing, you're not Catholic, you're not Jewish, you're not hurting, you're not hating, you're just laughing. Amen! Look, I understand the intention of this line, and the sentiment it puts forward. Humor can call to an audience's attention the small ways in which our lives aren't so different, and the recognition of our human foibles can help bridge the gap across the divisions in our identities. But the actual literal meaning of the line, in the context of the scene where it's spoken, 
doesn't quite communicate that notion. And I'm sorry I called you amateurs. We've been called a lot worse. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. And we always laugh it off. Yeah. <laughs> you see, that's what's important because when you're laughing, you're not Catholic, you're not Jewish. See, the argument being made here isn't for comedy as reducing harm, it's for comedy as ignoring harm. The notion that a joke intended for everyone will be enjoyed by everyone equally, regardless of background. And, you know, I just don't agree with that. While comedy can certainly reach across the aisle and aim for a universality of experience, the identity of the audience hearing the joke does actually matter a lot regarding how they'll respond to the joke. A black audience member doesn't respond to the Black Sea joke the same way a white audience member does. The same for a Native American audience member hearing Sister Pocahontas, or an audience member with personal experiences with leprosy hearing Difficult Transition, or even someone with traumatic experiences of abuse by members of the Catholic Church watching the Nonsense series in total. As stated earlier, the trouble with trying to avoid discomfort in a work of art is that discomfort, like humor, is subjective. Some people will simply not receive the comfort you're attempting to provide. The issue for nonsense, however, is that its entire ethos, its complete raison d'etre, is to provide comfort for everyone. The presumed universality of its humor is its essential appeal and its sole objective. A production of nonsense that fails to provide comfort to a portion of the audience is not succeeding at its goals. Or so I thought... Because when I pressed Dan Goggin on this point, he bit the bullet. You cited like, oh, you know, some people saying we can't do this joke because it's going to piss off two people that would, you know, get angry, write an email. Do you think that those two people are not included in the definition of the everyone that nonsense is aiming for? I, I think that over the years it's changed. There, there are more people that either have a chip on their shoulder or, you know, the gun drawn the people that I talked to, they said, you can't say anything. Mm -hmm. you, you can't be funny because however you're funny, some, it's going to bug somebody. Mm -hmm. And then they're going to make a big stink about it. And so it's like, oh, fine, you know, go see something else. The notion of a work of art that appeals to literally all audiences without exception is functionally impossible. I'm not saying you can't get close, and among musical comedy works from the late 20th century, nonsense is probably closer than most. It's also important to remind people that the question of what nonsense is, as a work of dynamic art, is constantly in flux. If an audience member watches a regional production of nonsense that has cut the dated material out of the script, the answer of how much discomfort nonsense causes for that audience member will likely be less or none. As with the musicals The Drowsy Chaperone or The Music Man, which I discussed last March, I don't think that the Nonsense series is so inherently tied up in potential discomforts that it couldn't be countered in a smartly theorized staging that aims for harm reduction rather than harm ignorance. The question then becomes, will all productions of the Nonsense series do that? And the answer is almost certainly no, for a reason that's been kind of hovering over the series for this entire video. Goggin is very proud of the fact that Nonsense, the first show, has become a staple of community theaters nationwide, helping to keep those theaters afloat with its low budget and high returns. One of the proudest things that we have about Nonsense is over all these years, we've saved over a hundred theaters from bankruptcy. Our general manager used to say, five black sheets and a piano and you got yourself a show. But small community theaters often perform for, well, small communities, where the experience of being an actor isn't the same as performing in a large city, or making acting your regular job. In particular, that entire screed I kicked off part 6 with about actors advocating for more equitable conditions, those reforms might not be in play for a tiny regional company. In that earlier video about Drowsy, I made the following claim about musicals attempting to present dated narratives or morals in a current day production. Even if the story is still set in 1990, the actors, the audience, the musicians, everyone responsible for making this work of art exist, they are in the current day, endorsing a narrative which 28 years of socio-political discourse now frames very differently. But here's the bitter truth lying underneath that observation. If you are actually able to get together a group of people who are all not discomforted by the data material being presented, 
then yes, it is possible to present data material in a dynamic format. If no one who would disagree with you is present, then you might as well be back in the 1990s. Or, in the case of Nonsense, 1985, which again I'm focusing on because it's the most produced out of the series. Now, how would you go about assembling a group of people who are all in agreement that the material of Nonsense causes no discomfort? Well, remember how I talked about Goggin growing up in a small community where he, quote, never felt prejudice? Here's the thing, that community still exists. And I'm not just talking about Alma, Michigan, but about the many, many communities around the country where the number of young woke people with their aimed pistols of social justice just don't have the same influence that they do in the major cities. After the first two shows, the remaining five Nonsense sequels all debuted at the Chanhassen Dinner Theater in Minnesota, in a town that was, as of the 2010 census, 92% white, meaning these shows developed in front of audiences that may be similarly sheltered from seeing prejudice firsthand, that hold similar opinions on what counts as discomforting. The question of how much discomfort Nonsense provokes is largely a responsibility of the company producing Nonsense. And while the writing of the script can certainly encourage comfort, there's nothing Goggin can do as author to guarantee the eradication of all discomfort in production, unless he personally directs all the shows. But more than just the production, the definition of nonsense is also influenced by the viewer. If you don't have that Gen Z view of the world that keeps an eye open for material that has aged poorly, then you might listen to the lyrics of Difficult Transition and find nothing but humor in those hilarious African tribal names, or the comedy of lepers having their limbs falling off. If the audience finds it comforting, and the theater finds it comforting, and the actors find it comforting, then that production of nonsense is fully executing on Goggin's intentions for it. It is fostering nothing for the actors and audience but warm, genuine, uncomplicated comfort. You can look at this as the vindication of the material by virtue of finding the community of people it was always intended for. Or you can look at this as a horrifying moment of indoctrination, in which the actors and audience are being encouraged not to think more critically about the potential discomfort of the material. Because ultimately, the comfort provided by these small community theater productions of the uncensored nonsense still have a discomforting cost. It's just that the audience isn't the one paying that cost. It's a discomfort that will be felt by the innumerable people of color that those majority white audiences will interact with in the future, weaned as they were to see the stereotypes and normalizations of nonsense codified as inherently, unquestionably comforting. It's in the depictions of Africans, or the mentally ill, or the Catholic Church that affect how people comprehend the world around them, how they vote, how they organize, how they build a code of morals. See, there are really two different ways of creating comedy. A more modern way is in recognizing that the world around us is full of challenges and discomforts, some of which are universal and some of which are specific. But in the recognition that we all face those struggles, there is a shared understanding that we are not alone. It is a comfort that comes from recognizing our shared discomfort. The other method of comedy doesn't let the world in, but actively shuts it out. It aims to eradicate the elements of the world that trouble us, and revel in only what we can love wholeheartedly and without overthinking. It's a method that asks a younger generation to abandon the critical lens through which they see the world, that never saw the political undertones of their favorite comfort media and doesn't want to start, that wants the art they consume to remain a safe space where they can cordon themselves off from the discomforts that happen elsewhere to other people. Goggin's favorite review quote about the Nonsense series is, If laughter is the best medicine, Nonsense will make doctors obsolete. If I may offer my impression on the series after spending 14 hours in its untroubled world, if ignorance is bliss, Nonsense is heaven. I don't think anybody would think of I Love Lucy as offensive. And, and yet, you know, there's somebody who's going to find things wrong with it. Well, there was no, there were no black people in it. Well, back then there weren't black people in anything, and it wasn't. So it didn't mean that you know, when Lucy made fun of something, that it wasn't funny. There was one time I said, if, if I had a lot of money, I was going to buy a loft, but inside the loft, I was going to build Lucy and Ricky's apartment, so I could live in that apartment because. To me, that was that was such a happy place. My partner for six years was a Tony voter, and so we had to go to everything. And I would always say, is this gonna end happy? 
because <laughs> it's not any happy. I really don't want to go. I remember the first time I ever saw Death of a Salesman. I was with two producers and we came out at intermission and I said, you know, I don't think this is going to work out very well. <laughs> <laughs> the idea behind the show was always, it wasn't about pushing people's buttons. It wasn't about offending people, all that kind of stuff. We know most of you people who've come in, especially in the world today, it's it's been rough. So let's just see if we can't cheer everybody up, you know. I'm very um, po positive oriented about things mm -hmm. so that you know if something bad happens i'll find something good about it and we'll move on and i don't i don't get depressed I, even about horrible things i'll think of something else for two hours i just forgot there was any problems anywhere in the world I praised Dan Goggin earlier for his willingness to see the shows adjust and change across regional productions, with alternate lines that could be sent out to companies who refuse to perform certain dialogue or lyrics. That said, it's important to mark the difference between an edit being made available and an edit becoming required. With script files being digital, it's easy to make spot edits ahead of a new edition of the script being printed out for licensees. Goggin could, for example, take the newer version of Difficult Transition, the one he claims is funnier than the original, and sub it in as the updated version of that song in the published script of Nonsense, thereby precluding any future regional productions of the show from indulging in the subjective humor of the African tribes with leprosy. But in his experience, those requests are remarkably infrequent. All We had 95 productions this past year, 81 coming up. Out of all of those productions, we had two questions about that. Mm -hmm. And only that little section. And they said, could we just remove it? And I said, well, I wrote a new part. It's within that admission of Goggin's own perspective on what he personally considers comforting still affects the show. There are still enough people out there who find comfort in the original script, and the costs of leaving it as is aren't apparent. At least, not enough to make the changes permanent. When Dan Goggin cited to me that there were 81 productions of the series planned for this upcoming season, he seemed genuinely delighted that the series retains the foothold on the world's regional companies that it does. It's undeniable that the musicals will have a long life in performance, past the 40th anniversary of the duplex run this September. But the question of what format that future legacy will take is still unclear. Will the turning tide of what a general audience considers to be comforting doom the show to a future of performing only in communities insular enough to not be concerned by its content? Or will script adjustments be codified in such a way that the show will gain a foothold in the musical theater canon, with productions that please even the young audiences and their pointed liberal crosshairs? It's appropriate, perhaps, that the most fitting parallel to the situation with Nonsense can be found in the anecdote that brought the series into being in the first place. When Pope John XXIII called the Second Ecumenical Council, it was done out of fear that the rigid dogma of the Catholic Church was limiting its reach to an increasingly flexible and tolerant world. There were only two methods of moving forward. The Church could double down, retreat into their comfort zone, and watch their influence on the world stage slowly dwindle to a handful of increasingly devout and insular communities that remained unchallenged by their view of what it meant to be Catholic. Or, in a daring move that upset many but liberated many more, they could fundamentally redraw the boundaries around their faith, allow a more progressive faction to shape the practice of their beliefs, and finally allow their most devoted members to wear something other than a uniform black veil. And it didn't change overnight. Many of the nuns still chose to retain their old habits in order to, quoting the musical, retain their magic spell. But those that chose to modernize weren't doing so out of hatred towards the church. They did it because it allowed their devotion to the church to take a new form. A more comforting form. One that was their choice and not the dictations of someone they'd never met regarding how to practice their religion. The metaphor about theater being our church is a bit mixed, I will admit, but the sentiment expressed by the parallel shows the diverging path for the future of the Nonsense series either towards an adherence to the law of the published script that will keep the show performed only by acolytes, or towards a greater acceptance of the script's fluidity that will bring the story to a wider audience. And to be clear, there is a much larger conversation to be had here about how this issue is complicated by the rights agreements with Concord Theatricals, or what the show looks like in a future without Goggin at the helm to write new material, or whether a musical whose entire focus remains aimed at comedy over narrative will ever find interest from professional theaters with higher cultural ambitions. As before, I am pointing out a crossroads. 
although I hope my argument in the previous section shows the unintended cost of choosing the path of insularity. As I said way back in the first half of this video, the intention of the Nonsense series, the intention of Dan Goggin to create a fundamentally comforting work of art is an inherently worthwhile one. But it must be recognized as an endeavor that will never be completely finished, a goal that will always be approached and rarely, if ever, reached. What a general audience finds comforting will always be changing, because the people that make up a general audience are always changing. What Dan Goggin has created has few parallels across the history of the performing arts. A series of musicals created with not just the audience experience in mind, but the experience of the performer, too. And not just the original performers, but the multitude of performers to come in the ongoing dynamic life of the scripts. The definition of nonsense, fundamentally, will always evolve with each production. But what nonsense could be is still undetermined. I, for one, find the vision of a future where Dan Goggin's writing finds a wider audience by continually exploring and exploding the definition of what it is to be a nun to be quite a comforting notion, indeed. The booking companies told me, they said, people are just crying out for some kind of comfort and fun that make him feel good for two hours. Oh my God, this was so much fun. It was such a relief not to have, you know, just all bam, bam, horrible, 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 you know. So I think that the, that, that to, to this day, I think that nonsense books, the idea that you, you wanted to do something that just made people feel good 